So you know when you're in a meeting and your coworkers come in and they just saw your boss naked at the gym? <laughs> Is it big? It's this big. No, dude, it's like this. Draw it on the board. No, nobody. Okay, none of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> None of you guys are American sitcom writers. This is the stuff we talk about: <laughs> penises and ideas. <laughs> How do we come up with our ideas? Well, my last TV network had a formula: heart plus fart equals art. <laughs> no, come on, this is going to change your life. I want to tell you the things that I learned in the sitcom writers' room. First, a bit about how the room works. Every sitcom you've ever seen was written by about 10 people around a conference table. On this one show, we worked through lunch and dinner and breakfast. We ordered so frequently from one restaurant, they sent over a massive pan of tiramisu. At 11 p.m., there was still so much of it left. We dared a junior writer, Tim, to eat it in an hour for cash. <laughs> Five minutes in, he turned gray. Toward the end, he started vomiting back into the pan. <laughs> And there was a surprisingly heated debate over whether the pan had to be totally empty in order for Tim to collect. <laughs> We signed off on it. He bolted to the bathroom, and as his gagging echoed down the hallway, there was like this love glow in the writers' room. We were on this united high. <laughs> Tim now runs TV shows, and I wonder: would he still choke down dessert for cash? Maybe. But wondering led me to my first lesson: if you haven't worked with someone in over five years, have you really worked with them? Before you talk about someone, think of your view of them as current. Our impressions of people can get frozen in time, but people change. It's not just kids who go through five-inch growth spurts. And thanks to a pan of tiramisu, I like to think we all grew that day. <laughs> Second story: another show. I worked with a guy who was a former actor who used to play Kinnicky in a production of Grease. So of course we asked him to sing Grease Lightning, and of course he refused. Next to him sat Maggie, my hero. That season, while we worked 18-hour days, she went through cancer. She wrote another project that the network rejected, and her husband left her. Throughout the whole thing, she was amazing. She made us laugh every single day. She brought it. She was professional. So professional that Kaniki, sitting right next to her, missed the part about her husband leaving. So when she went to loan her car to a coworker, he was confused. Well, why isn't your husband driving it? Well, when's he coming back? We begged him with our eyes to stop, and finally he realized, "Oh my God, Maggie, I'm so sorry." Maggie took the perfect pause and said, "You know what would make me feel better?" We knew instantly. <laughs> Kaniki jumped up on the table. Go grease lightning! You're burning up the quarter mile. And this is us. Grease lightning! Go grease lightning! It was maybe my favorite thing ever in a writer's room, and it happened because Maggie hung in there. She could spot the opportunity, and that was transformative. Which leads me to my second lesson: we can only be embarrassed if we agree to be. Maggie not only didn't cry; she got a huge laugh. Laughing connects us to each other. It gives us something to hold on to. It means we're not alone. Which leads me to the third and final lesson: being able to make people laugh must be what it feels like to have a penis. <laughs> it connects you to the most intimate part of another person. It can get you into and out of outrageous situations, <laughs> and I might lose some of you here, like half the crowd. But being able to make someone laugh might be better than having a penis. It's a superpower we all have, and it gets better with age.